Hello, and welcome back to Learning with Lee. In today's episode, we are going to take a look at iterators and how you can use iterators in your code. Now, these iterators can be ones that you created for your own custom data structure, such as what we did in the previous episode. They can be ones that are provided for you in the standard library. And the general theory that we're going to go over in this will end up applying to pretty much any iterator where it comes from your own, from the standard library, or from a third-party library. We're not going to be fully exhaustive in our analysis of iterators and how to use them. However, we will end up providing a good enough overview so as that there isn't much you'll ever have to look up on your own about how to use iterators after this. Because frankly, as I've said before, iterators are fairly simple. They're merely an abstraction of a pointer. And you can see within here why these can end up being useful. However, before I begin on showing you these demos, I need to show you some different problems I had in the code that I showed you in the previous episode. To begin with, in this line here, I had forgotten to convert this into an exclamation point. I had converted it over here into an exclamation point, but I had left this alone as this from when I had copied this line down to here. Now for a bit more of some significant problems. And that's that you'll see these lines here where I now have get next and get previous. Initially, I was using just previous and next directly, and you might be like, okay, well, let's see if I change this to previous, and this is going to be one of the oddest things that you'll see. It ends up building correctly. It doesn't complain. However, if I then change this guy to next, figuring I can use private member variables from within pointer just by having it be of this pointer type here. The answer is, is that no, you actually can't, because now let's build it, and you're going to see these errors down here. And the fact is, is that it doesn't give us an error, though, until you end up using this operator. And because we aren't using the minus minus operator anywhere in our examples, we don't get an error from trying to access this private member variable when I showed it down here where it was previous. Which is why we end up having to use get next and get previous, and it's a bit odd. Your compiler won't actually detect that you're trying to use a private member of this pointer or of this reference. And what that will end up meaning is, is that you have to end up anticipating that, or whenever you end up using it in code, it will then throw an error, and then you can go, oh yeah, I need to fix that, and then you should probably go through and just fix everything, so that you don't go, now I'm adding in a minus minus somewhere, oh, I need to go back and fix this. And it could be especially bad in case you were using some third-party library, where these operators, or if you're creating a library for somebody else to use, where these operators aren't used within that library, it might compile it fine for your library. And it might not complain about the fact that you were using previous because of the fact it's not used within your library. However, when somebody else then tries to consume it on their machine and tries to then go, okay, I'm going to minus minus this iterator that was supplied for me by this third-party library, all of a sudden they're going to run into issues. So you have to be really cautious with this and really cautious with using these pointer and reference type defs because it's something that's pretty specific to going, okay, I have this template. I'm going to then, in case we go back over in this area here, you can see how it ends up creating these references and pointers as part of the template. Then within iterator, it ends up type defing those to this pointer and this reference type here. And using those ends up leading to some weirdness with this compilation that I just described. So that's something that you need to be very aware of and need to be very cautious with because you can end up screwing up not only your code but other people's code in case you don't get this correct. The next thing is, is that down here you'll note that I have get item ref. And the reason why I'm not just doing get item, and previously this was actually item similar to how I was using previous and next, and it has the same issue in that item is private, so I couldn't just use it. However, I can't use get item because get item actually returns a copy, and I want a reference of the item. So that's why I created this minor little method here. It's not necessarily that good of an idea. I mean, realistically, I probably should, if I'm going to allow anyone to ever have access to that reference, they should just have access to it via get item rather than passing a copy. But for now, that is enough in order to cover that portion of the topic. Then over in here, we have our demo. And for this, we're just going to do something really basic. It's just creating a list of integers, 100 integers, fairly simple. And then it's going to output them with a space between each of them, which is what this is doing right here. Now, there is one important thing to note about our implementation 
of the iterator. And that's that, in case we take a look over in here and scooch on down to here for begin and end, what you'll see is that our end position happens to be the final element in our list. And that makes a lot of sense, especially because our list loops back on itself. And one of the things that's important to note about the standard library is that a lot of their stuff doesn't end up looping back on itself. It has a very clear start and end. And it basically, even if it's bidirectional, or even if it's random access, such as a string here, it's going to go, okay, I can basically have an iterator that's pointing back to here past the final element, and I can have an iterator pointing either to the first element or before the first element, and I can do that fairly easily. However, for our doubly linked list, because of the fact that it effectively acts as a loop, we can't really insert these custom pointers in there. We could possibly, however, we would have to significantly modify how link operates. It all of a sudden would have to be aware of the fact that they're iterators and have to be aware of the fact that it might need to skip over those. Same thing for changing our implementation on linked list. And it overall would be a massive, massive problem for how we're actually doing that. And it would more tightly couple our iterator implementation to link and linked list, since now both of those would need to be aware of it. So the problem is, is that if I do an iterator like this, where I just go, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning, begin outputting each element followed by a space, what's going to end up happening is that because of this little termination condition here, it's not going to end up outputting the final element. That's because what it's going to do is it's going to have this iterator here. It's going to see, oh, we're at the end of our list, which actually we want to output because we're not past the end. And that's one of the important things to note about things in the standard library, like this one down here. You are actually beyond the S. You're effectively at the null terminating character or possibly even further on. For strings, it's rather easy to say it's the null terminating character. For something like an array of data, it would be, okay, is your pointer past the end of our known or size of the array? So that happens to be fairly significant in terms of a difference between our implementation and the standard library's implementation. However, there are very few good, clean ways in which we can get around it. So what we ended up having to do for this demo was we need to also then output the final element on its own, followed by endl. And to be fair, this actually ends up being somewhat clean in terms of how it's done. Because if I were to change this and this were allowed to output the final element up in here, I'd have to have a check, basically something such as if, and then do a thing of this, and basically equals list.end or equals the second to last element or something like that. And in that case, we output it with endl. In the other case, we output it with this. And it would actually add in additional lines of code and make our code a bit uglier and less succinct than it is currently. So there is some benefit to the way in which it is done, though it does differ from the standard library implementation. So for the standard library implementation, you can see down here how this is basically identical on these two lines to these two lines. Now, one of the things you'll note is this auto keyword. And I'm using this in here because otherwise what I have to do is I have to go, okay, I need ILL and I need an ILIST iterator int. And in some cases, you might have additional namespaces. Your iterator might be within a class itself. So in case we take a look down here, you can see how it has standard basic string char has those things there, and then it has iterator here. And it ends up being a fairly long set of stuff. And auto basically says, let the compiler figure out for me what type IT should be, and then allow me to basically use it as that type, just based upon context of what you're assigning to it and stuff like that. So in this case here, it can automatically determine it for you. Now there's a few problems with auto. Well, there's one big problem, and that big problem happens to be that it obfuscates what you're doing for anyone else reading your code. And even for yourself reading your code, in case it's been a few weeks or a month or two, you might go back to something you did earlier and be like, hang on, what type exactly is auto? So in general, don't use auto unless it happens to be fairly sparing in its usage and fairly clear in its usage. Typically, I personally only use auto for iterators just because they tend to be fairly ugly in terms of how much you actually have to write out for them. And it does make it a bit cleaner, a bit more consistent when you're just going, okay, auto IT equals something dot begin. 
And technically, it even slightly ends up decoupling your code here from that implementation because you don't then have to also modify. In case, say, you want to change iterators, you change data structures, etc., you don't have to change whatever type your iterator is. The auto will automatically do that for you. So it does make your life a bit easier, but it should be used sparingly or cautiously just because of the fact that it can really make code much harder to read and hard to understand what's going on. So then in here, same exact thing as before where we start at our first element, same as what we did with our list. We go to our last element. However, as I was specifying, it does have one thing beyond the S. And then within here, we're just going to output this followed by a space. And then to sort of similarly show something that we can do is we can actually modify using that iterator itself. We can modify whatever we were going over. And we could have done the same thing with our iterators up here. In case I wanted to, I could have done something like star it and then have it equal to star it times star it, which may look a bit weird, but I'm multiply basically saying it equal to itself squared. However, for now, that's just going to be something I'm going to leave alone and not really deal with that. But you can modify these iterators within there. And that's the point of this thing here is that you can see down here how now we have these capital C's, how we end up outputting it with this followed by space. And you can see that we don't have this line here down here. You can see that after this S, there's a space there in case you wanted to end up having it go directly to endl. I'd have to do some additional work in here to check whether or not it happens to be the final element before end, which basically would be like if it plus one equals end, do this, or I might have to create a second iterator within here that's equal to it, basically do a copy of it, and then plus plus one of them, and to see what the next one is. So it would actually be somewhat less efficient and less clean than what we ended up getting out up here. That happens to be how this ends up working. It goes through, does that. And the main reason why I'm doing the second output down here is just so you can even see the capital C's actually got inserted correctly and replaced the lowercase c's. Then you can also use iterators for insertion. And this happens to be a variation on an iterator known as an inserter. And I'm not going to go too much into what inserters are. Really, all you need to know is that in case you remember how I got, went over the different types of iterators, they're a variant on an output iterator in that you can output basically into some data type, in this case here, a string. So we're going to combine our string of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious with our string of Gettysburg four score and seven years ago. All I'm going to do is I'm going to find the first capital C that I had created up here, and I'm going to insert Gettysburg into that spot. And there's a few different variants on this version of insert. So in case I do this, you can see all these ones in here, in which they end up taking different iterators. They're the ones that we went over previously, but these ones with iterators we didn't go over. And for this case here, we're using this second version where it ends up having this first and last. So basically we end up getting two iterators in there. I could have tried to find a substring in there, like the first S to the first, I don't know, let's go with Y. And then we could have inserted that. But for this, we're just going to insert the whole thing. And you can see down here how it finds that first C, which winds up over here, and inserts it before that point. And the major thing about inserters is that they're also designed to hide the fact that we might not know how much memory this particular data structure has available to it. Because in case, for example, I was doing that on an array, and that array only had 100 elements that I could have there, and the amount I would be inserting would be pushing us over 100 elements by the end of it, my inserter would need to have custom logic in order to both handle that, so is it either it handles it correctly and ends up truncating some of it and removing some of the data, or it would have to throw an exception, or it would have to be able to allocate new data. And that's stuff that I'm going to leave for you to look up on your own on how inserters exactly work and how you can create your own ones. However, they are just a variant on an iterator. So I believe that should be enough for you to get going with iterators on your own, for you to be able to use them, to create them, and to just mess around with them. If you want to, I'd recommend spending a bit of time with strings as well as also, I know that we haven't gotten into vectors yet, but vectors are just a form of dynamic array. 
So I would recommend spending some time with strings and vectors and how to use their iterators so that you can get a bit more comfortable with them. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.